원어투 빙고 하늘에서 All right, well, welcome back to another episode of the Fatal Conceits podcast, dear listener. It's the show, as you know, about money, markets, mobs, and manias. If you have not already done so, please head on over to our Substack page. You can find us at bonnerprivateresearch.substack.com. Uh, on that page, you'll be able to find, I think, probably hundreds now of essays uh, authored by today's guest, Bill Bonner, in the daily section. We've got plenty of research reports from... Dan Denning and Tom Dyson, and of course, plenty more conversations like this under the Fatal Conceits podcast tab at the top of the page. Uh, so without further ado, I think we can, you can probably see them in uh, your screen there, uh, gilted cornices, remnants of a bygone era of abundance. Mr. Bill Bonner, welcome to the show. How do you do, sir? Thank you, Joel. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah. Now, you're up there in uh, Baltimore at the moment. In That's great. Baltimore. And, and you're right. It is kind of the bygone <laughs> remnants of an ancient civilization. Baltimore was, by the way, the richest city in America in, say, the early 19th century, because it had such a great harbor. And it mm. was also connected to the, uh, through the Cumberland Gap, it was connected to the whole mid, uh, what do you call that, the uh, Ohio, on the Ohio Valley and all that area over there on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. So mm -hmm. it was a big, important in port for people coming from Europe and a big, important port for people making mostly food things that they, they exported to Europe. And people got rich. And they, in, in movies from, say, the 1920s or so, maybe a little bit later, they will frequently have a rich person as somebody from Baltimore. <laughs> and that to us seems so unlikely now. It's hard right. <laughs> <laughs> to to be rich like a like a Baltimorean is kind yeah, of like to yeah. be rich like a like an Argentine, which you know. Same thing, yeah. Very talking similar. to you from, yeah, exactly, exactly. And and I I just I'm kind of racking my brain here, but how on earth were they able to get rich without uh, ESG uh, governance and diversity boards and uh, it seems well, without, impossible. That was before the foundation of the Federal Reserve. I mean, how did they how did they know <laughs> what interest rates to charge? You know, they were building. <laughs> In the early 19th century here in Baltimore, they had huge factories. They made things. They made things that they exported <laughs> at a profit. How did they know how to do that without the Fed showing them what interest rates to charge and so on? Oh, and without yeah. the Fed printing money to stimulate them. Nobody stimulated them at all. They were stimulated by the desire to make money, I guess. And they did quite well with it. And that, But now we have, thank God, we have the Fed to stimulate the economy when it's needed, to support the stock market when it seems to be falling, and to provide us with the interest rates that we need. How they know what interest rates we need has never been clarified, but that's <laughs> one of the mysteries of the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we certainly couldn't rely on uh, the market self-stimulation. Uh, no, no. <laughs> top down, top down. So speaking, uh, of course, that dovetails into news this week of, uh, I don't know whether you would call him uh, our colleague, but but another another uh, economic luminary, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Benjamin, Benjamin Bernanke, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. This, of course, yeah. is the man who uh, had the courage to act and who saved us from not having an economy on, on Monday, uh, as, as he warned us with such... Yeah. Uh, such October the 5th, in 2008. You know, he, he went before Congress and he said, look, if you guys don't pass this act, which I think was the what was known as the Tau Fact, it was a lot of spending to try to stimulate the economy, <laughs> that if you don't pass this, we may not have an economy on Monday. He was talking on Friday. And uh, thank God he rose to the challenge and showed that courage to act, because otherwise we still wouldn't have an economy. <laughs> <laughs> What, what does it say? About, I mean, it does seem so through the looking glass, you, you know, up is down, back is, you know, forwards. When we see that not only did the man who, you know, failed to foresee the bubbles that had been created during the Greenspan era and that had led to the, you know, to these these enormous uh, imbalances and malinvestments in, in particular, the housing market. I remember, mm -hmm. your, I remember mm -hmm. yourself writing about, um, you know, huge irregularities uh, in the mortgage-backed securities markets and, and Eric Fry writing about that, our colleague Dan Denning 
uh, was was on the case, of course. So mm-hmm. it seemed like everybody except Federal Reserve economists were on the case. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. What what does it say that fourteen years later, having uh, you know stimulated, it seems now even it now even a larger bubble that we not only look back and have not learned our lesson, we're gifting the guy uh, the the highest prize there is in in the dismal science. Well, I think those people at the Nobel Committee must have a sense of humor. That's all I can think of. They, <laughs> a they, sense of humor. <laughs> they, they are very, either very dumb or very cynical. And I'm not sure <laughs> which it is, because Ben Bernanke, if you remember that time, he was wrong about everything. I and mean, No major issue came to him that he was not wrong about it. He was the one who said the subprime problem, you know, before the crisis of 2008, the subprime problem problem crisis is contained of course it wasn't contained at all and he had all these things that that were idiotic like zero race he came up with that qe he didn't invent it it was the Mm -hmm. japanese who 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 developed it but a lot of these things which now we see clearly were are the cause the approximate cause not the only cause but the, the approximate cause of our inflation and our economy, which is now melting down in order to try to contain inflation, those stemmed from policies put in place by Ben Bernanke. <laughs> <laughs> and again, he, not the only one, because Janet Yellen kept doing the same thing, and Powell came along and followed right in their footsteps. But for the Nobel Committee to award him a, 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 a Nobel Prize is really quite remarkable, and it calls into question our whole, our whole <laughs> elite process you know why do they think that he should get a prize for that and then to have the hubris the conceit the unmitigated gall to write a book called the courage to act uh, i thought it was a joke when i first heard about it i said nobody no sensible person would do that even if he believed that he had the courage to act even if he believed that he had saved the economy you still wouldn't put it out there like that. It makes you sound like an utter fool. You know, it, what it does is it invites the wrath of the gods. You know, there's some way they, up there, they're, they they must be after him now. I don't know yeah, what they're this, going to do, but <laughs> got to be after him. Pride before the fall. And for, for yeah. a man with a legacy unblemished by, as you said, a single success in the in the real world. So it, uh, it does beg a lot of questions. But uh, let's... Fast forward then uh, 14 years after uh, that fateful uh, October Friday uh, to where we are presently. And as you look across the landscape, I know you spend a lot of time down here in in Argentina and then split between both sides of the Atlantic. When you look around, um, you know, when you look forward to what has happened in in Argentina, you know, they've they've been at the forefront of every boneheaded uh, economic and financial policy known to man real pioneers in the uh in the in the dismal art when you look from here to where you are now in the united states you look over to what's happening with the bank of england with you know in the japanese bond market it does seem that there are enough signs that sort of point to this time maybe actually being different and this time maybe being a the end of what you and dan and uh, and our colleague tom dyson have called the greatest financial experiment in history well, I think that's exactly right. And I think people are having a very hard time coming to grips with it. Even people in the financial industry, they're so used to. And I was just speaking to some of my colleagues here in Baltimore about it and trying to explain it from my standpoint. And I realized that everybody I was talking to was born after 1980. <laughs> I mean, they <laughs> they were literally not born in any time other than the boom that we have known for the last 40 years. In 1980, of course, you know, the Paul Volcker got control of inflation. Interest rates came down ever since. And mm-hmm. uh, inflation rates came down ever since. And there were a lot of things going on. Most important was the entry of like 500 million Chinese people <laughs> into the market. And those people produced things at a low price. But for these people, I'm talking about people who were born after 1980, it's very hard to get to understand that the whole circumstance of your life, the whole circumstance of your life has been phony, <laughs> fake, <laughs> been faked up by the Federal Reserve to give the impression that everything is always up, the stocks 
and, and, and financial advisors will tell you this, these young financial advisors say, well, yeah, stocks go down, but they always go back up. And so what you have to do is buy the dip. You got to, now they're all out there looking for the bottom. You know, the mm -hmm. bottom is the point in which they don't go down anymore. Now they're going to go up. So you got to buy. And they have these charts and graphs that show that if you buy at every dip, it always goes up. But it's not that simple at all. If you had bought stocks in 1966, which was a, uh, a good year for a stock market, you would have held them for the next uh, 16 years until 1982, really. And they wouldn't, they, the, the prices would have been about the same, but because inflation was happening, you would have lost 75% of your money. That was a long time to lose 75% of your money. Mm -hmm. And to talk to somebody and say, well, you just hold on, they'll go back up. Well, maybe they'll go back up, but it could be after you're dead. Right. <laughs> you, know, you don't have an infinite amount of time here. So, uh, and so there are times in history. And I think this is the key point that if you look at anybody who is telling you they have a good track record, of course, that's everybody. And uh, in the financial <laughs> industry, you know, they they boast about what they've done and so on. All of that happened during a very special time which no longer exists mm. now that's a hard thing to un for anybody to understand and it's not that i'm saying by the way i'm not saying this is a new era i'm saying this is the old era <laughs> what, we, <laughs> what we've been through in the last mostly the last 10 years but this could you could stretch it and explain that whole 40 year period was a uh, a grotesque and unusual series of things that came together mostly including federal money printing by the Fed and uh, Q, QE and all the other things that they were doing. And that era is over and it, it, it ended in 2021. It ended when the bond market turned around. Mm. When, the, when the, Actually, it was 2020. It's the end of 2020, the bond market turned. When that happened, that was the end. And since then, nothing nothing has worked very well <laughs> because the because the fundamental aspect of our financial lives as is altered and it no longer is a market with falling interest rates it's no longer a market that the fed can support by driving interest rates lower it's a different world in which now the fed is battling inflation and once it decides not to buy, battle inflation anymore which i think it will then you're going to see worse inflation so that that won't be like the period from you know, from 1980 to 2020, not at all. It's going to be a whole different world with a different battle going on that'll be very hard to understand. And people say, well, your stocks are going to go up. Well, they probably are going to go up, but they're going to go up like they did in Zimbabwe. They're going to go up like they did in Venezuela and like they did in Argentina. All of those markets were once the world's top performers. But when you adjust for the inflation, <laughs> they were going down. <laughs> you know, it gets more complicated. And by the way, you had the advantage of being in the most complicated place in, in the world financially. And the Argentines learned to do these calculations. You know, they have the they, I, they have the blue dollar and they have the black dollar and they have the white dollar and they have the soy dollar. I'm not sure what that is, but now they have a new dollar. Did you know this? As of yesterday, the Qatar dollar oh because i haven't they, heard about the qatar dollar yeah, but the world I, I know Cup is taking place in oh. qatar <laughs> and for argentines who want to go they have a special exchange rate <laughs> oh okay the, you know that's that's very yeah. interesting because the, the i know I, did, I was aware of course having lived here the last dozen or so years that we we do have a dollar for every color of the rainbow and every <laughs> every gender you can imagine and every you know self identity Pesos down here itself identify as all kinds of things, but um, I was made sort of brutally aware when I was on vacation uh, just a couple of weeks ago to Brazil. Uh, I had forgotten that um, that there is a clawback tax. This is part of the capital controls that happen here when you use an Argentine credit card abroad. So oh, if you yeah. use if you use an, and I made the mistake of just, just handing handing it over for a hotel payment and then getting home to see my uh, my receipt and realizing that I'd had a, sort of an extra 40 or 50% clawed back out of my account uh, by the state. But this is the kind of shenanigans that happens when inflation gets out of hand. Yeah, um, yeah. But people, they find ways to try to obscure it, try to disguise it, try to eliminate it. And But what, 
but in doing everything but the one thing that really will work. <laughs> that right. is, yeah, they want to control prices. Now they're talking about controlling gas prices and states are providing people with extra money. You know, there are all kinds of things, people ways people find to try to overcome the, the fundamental reality of rising prices. And so, the, as you know, in Argentina, they, they don't work. They never right. work. <laughs> but, but that doesn't they, stop them from trying. They try time. <laughs> <laughs> So let, let's go back a little further then, because I, I was speaking to somebody just yesterday uh, about this and and a common um, kind of rejoinder to this narrative that that uh, that we present in uh, at Bonner Private Research is that, well, and I get this all the time, and I'm sure you do as, as well, where people say, well, you know, we've we've seen this before. It was the 1970s. Look, we had an oil embargo where a major oil producing block took supply off the global markets. We had the Nixon shocks. Uh, you know, we had double digit inflation. It was it was run away. Um, and then, you know, we got our Volcker uh, and he marched in and whipped everyone into shape. Uh, yeah. And then, as you said, and then we're off to the races for the next 20 or 40 odd years, rather. So what about today? Uh, is different fundamentally than the, that seventies landscape that people think will just kind of well we'll muddle through and then we'll be off for another you know be off to for a moonshot again. Well, the the fundamental difference is thirty trillion dollars. The federal debt in nineteen eighty was one was below it was actually nine hundred billion below a trillion. Now it's thirty one trillion, thirty times as much. That's the fundamental difference. And it's added to, but it's not just the federal debt. It's also private debt, household debt, corporate debt, all at record levels. So they take them together and the whole the whole sum of debt in America now is about $90 trillion. And what happens is in, in this process of rates going up to bring things back to normal, the cost of all that debt goes up. And you soon realize that you can't pay it, that it's not going to work. And that's what happened just uh, two weeks ago in England when they, the traders saw what was happening and they were bidding up the yields, that is to say they're bidding down the prices on UK government bonds. And pretty soon, all those big institutions, <laughs> the big institutions, the pension funds, they rely on the price of those bonds to make their numbers work. And then suddenly it became clear they were going to work. And so the bank had to intervene. The Bank of, uh, of England intervened with support, stimulation, whatever you call it. They were buying bonds in order to save them from, from bankruptcy. And so what I suspected, or I expect I have a high, this, this is what you call a high probability hunch <laughs> that, <laughs> that the U.S. is in the same situation, really, even a worse situation in some ways. And as the as the the Fed stays the course, you know, raises rates to try to get ahead of inflation, as they do so, we're going to see some things like the what we just saw in England that are certain institutions it could be Goldman Sachs, it could be could be J.P. Morgan, it could be a state pension fund like Calpers. Calpers, in, yeah. Calpers in California. What have they got? Billions of dollars, and they have done the same thing because they this this theory was pitched to them by Goldman Sachs of uh, what they call LDI, which was matching your liabilities to some long term goal. What it really <laughs> meant was they were they were ratcheting up the risk in order to try to improve the the uh, the results, but. You can do that if you're a young speculator, but if you're man managing the pension funds, you know, for a lot of retirees, that is practically criminal. Mm. <laughs> so what's <laughs> going to happen is somebody's going to get in big trouble and suddenly there's going to be that kind of melt up, meltdown crisis on Wall Street in which the pal and their and his fellow bankers they really they are work part of a banking cartel in order to save themselves and their clients and their members and wall street itself they're going to say well okay that was a good idea we need to get control of inflation but not right now now we have to save the system because otherwise it'll go totally bad so that's i mean that's i would say again a high probability hunch is that that's going to happen 
and we're going to see a pivot from the central bank because they just owe too much. So your your question was, what's the difference now than from 1980? Well, the difference is all of that debt that didn't they didn't have. Uh, you know, a Volcker could raise rates to 20 percent. He could do that. He was condemned. It was practically, mm -hmm. you know, he practically had to have an armed uh, guard. You could, people, people were threatening his life. But he could do that because America could afford it. Also, mm -hmm. by the way, mm -hmm. in 1980, it might have been 1979, stocks had already been, been squeezed so hard by inflation that they were already very, very cheap. They're not yet very, very cheap here. Right. <laughs> so uh, uh, we have a lot to lose, like trillions of dollars still to lose till we get there. By the way, we you know we like to measure things in terms of gold. And in terms of gold, for a brief time, you could buy the entire 30 Dow Jones industrial stocks for one single ounce of gold. And today, what is it? 18. Right. So we, what we're looking at is a, is a, a totally different situation in which we have high deficit. We have deficit was announced just yesterday for the current year of one point four trillion dollars. And this is at a year without really a crisis. The crisis hasn't appeared yet. Right. <laughs> they, They'll make one. Huge, they're running huge deficits. The debt is multiplying even without them. And, uh, and we're in a situation where we can no longer continue on this course of, of action. And so what will happen, I believe, is we'll see something will come up, some some uh, Lehman Brothers moment, as they say on Wall Street, will happen. And then the bank, the Federal Reserve, will be forced to change towards inflation. And once right. that happens, it'll be the next stage. The stage we're in now is deflation. We're deflating all of those, a lot of those uh, promises, obligations, debts, and so on from the bubble era. That will go on until it becomes really painful, and then they'll start inflating it again. And so this is uh, what sets the backdrop for uh, something that Richard Russell wrote about maybe 10 or 12 years ago, but it's the idea, and Tom Dyson, of course, has written about it um, uh, over on our Substack page as well, and that is the idea of... Uh, cash now, gold later. So gold after the pivot when hyperinflation uh, it hits off to the races. Yeah, and we see so far that that advice has been very, very good. Mm -hmm. Nobody really took it totally because it just felt awkward. You know, we saw inflation running at 8%. So who wants to hold cash when inflation is running at 8%? But in fact, dollars and ended up being the best investment so far this year. Right. <laughs> cash a lot now, of rubles. <laughs> as long as we're in the deflation stage, you want cash. And right. after the deflation stage, you want something else, probably gold, maybe stocks. <clears throat> you, know, you know, stocks go up too, but uh, you, you have to you have to adjust that price by inflation, which is then out of control for the foreseeable future. That right. is going to be a different world. And that's a world that you probably know better than anyone because the inflation rate in Argentina is about 90%. <laughs> yeah, officially, officially 90%. Officially. I, t I tell my friends down here that uh, that Americans and Brits and Australians are worrying about 9% inflation. And they asked me to repeat myself. Sorry, did you say nine? We would kill for a 9% inflation. That would be a, that'd be a day in the sun uh, for them. Uh, and so from then... From the past uh, and and the setup to where we think we kind of are uh, right now, uh, I was speaking with our colleague last week, uh, Mr. Byron King, and he and I spoke a little bit about the end of these three cheap, abundant stimulants of this kind of modern world that we've that we've all come to just take for granted. Certainly, in the last forty years. Uh, and you've alluded to a couple of them already, but we're we've, we're coming to the end through various geopolitical uh, kerfuffles and conflict of cheap energy. And we've outlined this uh, over at Bonner Private Research. And this feeds into our trade of the decade, uh, which is long conventional energy. But that's it, that whole era of, of, of you know, cheap, reliable, local gas for from various places seems to be coming to an end. This era of mass-produced manufactured goods and tight supply chains unruffled by 
uh, by policies or global lockdowns. That seems now to be coming to an end. And of course, we, as you've spoken about, we have potentially the end, at least for the foreseeable future, of cheap and available funny money, cheap and available discounted credit. Um, what, what, where do we go exactly from here? And I mean, is it time to just build a bunker and 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 buy gold and do nothing? I mean, like, how does the average person live through this if they're, well, if they've I, got I that in their mind? One thing that we learned from the Argentine example example is that you can live with uh, inflation at a fairly high level, and this is not the first time they've done it in Argentina. You can live, but you can't live very well. <laughs> the, economy, <laughs> the economy falls apart, and you need to have protection from the local currency, which, of course, is what you do and what foreigners in Buenos Aires do because they 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 operate on dollars rather than pesos. They're not they're not prisoners of the local peso economy. And in a larger scale, when and when the economy turns around with the pivot on the Fed and, and more inflation in the U.S., that will be a similar reality in America in which you will not want to be dependent on the dollar completely, which is why you'll probably want to move assets into things which are not dollar dependent, like gold, minerals, real things, timber. You know, I'd like to be in the timber business. <laughs> it looks good to me. Farming, you know, a lot of things which are real and don't depend entirely on the value of the dollar. So I think that's where you're going to, that's where we're going to end up. All right. Okay. Argentina. The end of the world, by the way. No, it is not the end of the world. If things go on, but they get more confusing and they right. and a lot more confusing and people don't know what to do or what to make of them. And that's where you get the real problems because they feel cheated. And they are cheated. The whole idea of inflation is to cheat people. And so the guy who's worked all of his life, he's expecting his pension and his pension comes in and he realizes it's only worth half what he thought it was going to be worth. That guy gets pretty mad and he yeah. justifiably, he gets angry. And next thing you know, he's out on the street or voting for somebody that he probably shouldn't vote for. Or what, you know, people look for solutions. They want solutions. They, they That's when they turn to the guy who has the easy solution. And that guy is almost always a fraudster. So it's a, it's a problem, and you get a big breakdown in society. You had the, in Argentina, they had that inflation of uh, I'm not sure the 80s, and ended up in the the generals taking charge in a military dictatorship, which is very common. In uh, Venezuela, you have that puppet government. I don't know what the world they are doing, but the, <laughs> the guy Matt Maduro said that he had a crow or something on his uh, shoulder who was whispering in his ear. Uh, channeling the uh, Chavez, who <laughs> was dead. Sounds <laughs> sounds kind of madness, but uh, sounds you know, as reasonable of, as uh, you know. Maybe we should maybe we get the Nobel Prize, no, the Nobel Committee, to give that guy a prize for telepathy from some yeah. from from the Great Beyond or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, speaking of the end of the world uh, and real assets, uh, we I, I promised our uh, our friend and our mutual friend and colleague. Uh, Diego Sampra, that we would mention uh, the solution and yeah, to all yeah. of life's problems, all of the above. Yeah. Uh, and that is uh, your harvest of Tacana wine from your ranch down here up in the northern reaches of Argentina. I don't know how many people have looked at this on a map, but it's way up there in the north, right up uh, close to the Bolivian border. And it's a, it's really extreme country. We've been up there uh, yeah, been up there a few it's, times, it's extreme, but yeah. Yeah. but so, as you so, say, the, the, the solution begins with that popping of the cork. The red six p of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the most pleasant sound of the day, and yes, it did. <laughs> pour yourself a drink, and here in the autumn, here in Maryland in the autumn, and recently it's been chilly enough, so I set a little fire in the fireplace, and at six o'clock, sit in front of the, the fire with a glass of uh, Malbec. And for a while, it doesn't seem too bad. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's palliative, uh, I think. It's, yeah. So uh, tell readers who, who haven't uh, haven't maybe experienced it yet, the difference between, I've spoken to Will, your son, Bonner, about this, the difference between what you can expect from a high-altitude uh, Malbec grown in really unique and extreme conditions and the kind of watery, diluted, over-sugared, dyed stuff that you might pick up at the supermarket you 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 stole my thunder there no, oh. <laughs> no but 
but that is the difference that uh, uh, the high altitude what what is what it's doing is it's the it's the extremes between day and night and extremes between day and night require a thick skin to survive and so the grapes grown at that that elevation they uh, tend to have these very thick skins and in the skins is all the flavor so when you get that uh, the high altitude not just our place but any place in the valley because we're in the valley is kind of the highest in the world for for wine you get the wine that is uh very strong and uh some people don't like it because it's it's too strong but you get used to it soon enough and, <laughs> and then everything seems weak right you know? so, <laughs> When I when I get when I drink my my own Malbec, I feel like well, there's real wine, and everything else seems to be kind of an imitation. <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, I think having a having a thick skin to to last one through is probably a good point to to end yeah. our uh, powwow today, Bill. I'm not sure where we're going to catch up next, but uh, I hope there's a, a glass of high altitude Malbec involved in it and we can get a have a front row seat to whatever is about to happen next in this passing right. parade. All right. Well, thank you, Joel. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Cheers. Bye.